Welcome back. I'm Pastor Chris Titus, and tis the season. Uh, this Sunday, we begin our journey through Advent as we move towards the uh, celebration of Christmas Day, the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. And in the church, we use this term Advent, and it comes from the Latin term Adventus, which roughly translates arrival. And so the celebration of Jesus Christ, the Advent, is the arrival of Christ uh, through his birth in Bethlehem. Uh, and that was the first Advent. Now, modern Christians are really actually living in the second Advent. We are waiting and watching and preparing for the return, uh, the arrival of Jesus Christ uh, in the end of times. And so, in the case of the first Advent, uh, the church was uh, trying to find a way to recognize the nativity in, in some sort of uh, powerful celebration, and so they developed this concept of Advent. Uh, Advent is not a term found in the Bible, but it's really the way the church has historically approached the birth of Jesus Christ and the uh, scripture that surrounds that happening. And so the season has uh, special hymns. We'll begin those this Sunday and uh, readings that reflect upon the importance of the Advent season, along with candles uh, that begin that celebration, all taking place in the four Sundays prior to Christmas. So that's the Advent uh, season. In practical terms, the church devotes at least a month and a bit more towards this Advent with the idea how important this event really is. And the celebration of Advent began back in the sixth century when the church was looking for a way to, to bring this celebration the, the majesty that it deserved. And so uh, initially Advent was a time that really focused on prayer, repentance, fasting, before moving on to the joy of gift giving. The main theme of Advent was to understand and be prepared for the arrival of Jesus Christ, to prepare ourselves, to recommit ourselves to our relationship with God. Now, in the modern world, unfortunately, we skip right to the gift giving part. And we lose a little bit of the majesty that's supposed to be there, and I think this is partially how the whole mythology regarding Santa Claus comes in because Christmas became less about prayer, repentance, and fasting and, and joyous celebration of Jesus' birth and more about the gift giving, which if you think about it, that's kind of Santa's main thing, right? So the whole mythology and the, and the fable of, of St. Nicholas uh, grew from that. In today's world, we spend very little time, I think, during Advent in joyous reflection. And maybe we need to think about that a little bit more, but also are we really prepared to do that is really the question. So we're gonna talk about that today. Um, the idea here is that all of Advent, all of the Christmas season is focusing on the gift giving of God not so much what we do between ourselves. And so the Apostle Paul, or excuse me, the Apostle John talked about this succinctly in John 3, 16. He records Jesus' words, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So the central theme of Christmas is God's gift to us, not us gift giving to others. And that is lost, I think, somewhat in the modern culture. Now it's okie dokie to give gifts. There's nothing wrong with that. We all like to um, give presents to people. We also like to receive them and that's all fine, but we can't lose the fact that in this celebration, Christmas is about hope, uh, the hope of our salvation through the gift that God has given us in Jesus Christ, the gift of salvation. So Christmas really is the beginning of that plan that God has to save us, and we need to think about that. So in order to prepare for the Advent season, we need to understand the scripture that surrounds it. And so there were four gospels found in the New Testament, 
Uh, and two of them contain the contents of the discussion of Jesus' birth. So that would be Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. We're going to primarily focus over the next few Sundays talking about Luke's Gospel because it's the most detailed one. And our Advent journey begins in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, with kind of an unlikely story, uh, a kind of a strange way that Luke starts out this conversation of Jesus' birth. Um, he begins by talking about the birth of another child, a child that will grow, become a man, and lead the way towards the Lord. This is John the Baptist. And as I said, why does Luke, a physician and historian, who's writing his gospel uh, for a uh, patron, a Roman patron of his, we, he calls him the most excellent Theopolis, uh, he's writing an orderly account of the life of Jesus. So if that's the case, why is he starting that storyline, that narrative, with a conversation about John the Baptist? And so today I want to talk about what's the importance of all of that. Um, there are a variety of reasons why uh, Luke would do this. And the primary one is that John's birth and life is to prepare Israel for the arrival of the Messiah, for the Adventists. And that is because the Israelites had wandered away from God. The chosen people of God had long sort of lost their focus uh, towards a relationship with God. In fact, we know that that loss of focus is about 400 years. So four generations of Hebrews had really not primarily focused on God. And we know that because that 400-year period is the last writing that we have in the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. So that time frame in between is about 400 years. So what were the Israelites doing during that time? Well, basically focusing on other things, family and jobs and relationships and drama and distractions of the world. That's what they were focused on. They weren't focused on any um, committed or ongoing relationship with God. And so there was no dialogue between God and his people. There were certainly many Hebrews who continued to worship the Lord, but there was really no interaction between God and the Hebrews during this 400 year period. And so we can kind of relate to this, I think. In the modern world, we get distracted with family and jobs and relationships and drama and distraction, and we don't talk with God much either, and we struggle in that area. I know in my life there's been times when I've gotten so busy that I don't feel the presence of God in my life. I don't hear his voice. And so this is really what was happening with the Israelites too. And so when Luke begins his gospel, he's really beginning to tell us about a time frame when God began to communicate again with the Israelites. And that first communication begins with John. And so this dry spell that took place uh, in the relationship between the Hebrews and uh, God has now come to an end. So there's a rekindling of that. And in order for the Hebrews to be ready to receive the Lord, there has to be this uh, preparation. And so Christmas, we think about how we prepare for Christmas. It tends to be about, well, I got to get a tree and I got to put the lights up and I've got to arrange the times for uh, when I'm going to have family over, or when I'm going to go visit family for Christmas, and I've got Christmas cards, and I've got all this stuff preparing for the actual December 25th event. Well, that really has very little to do with Jesus, if you think about it. So the Israelites needed to be prepared for the Lord, and I think we need to prepare better for um, Christ as well. And so in order for Israel to be prepared for the Adventus, the arrival, the Advent, um, this needed to be done, and it was done in a certain way through the birth of John the Baptist. And so when John arrives on the scene, when he is born, he will find Israel's relationship with God to be either weak or neglected. And so John brings baptism, a recommitment to God, back into the equation uh, imploring the Hebrews, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, repent and turn back 
to God to make their focus back on the relationship that is the most important. So if we look at John's birth as described by Luke in that gospel, we begin to realize that part of it is to say that there needs to be a relationship uh, recommitment, right? And so uh, we learn about this birth of John, and we find that there is one similarity to that birth of Jesus, and that is God does something impossible. He does something impossible in the incarnation of himself and Christ, and he does something impossible in the birth of John the Baptist as well. So John's father is Zechariah, and his mother is Elizabeth. You may remember Elizabeth. Uh, this is the person that Mary goes to see when she finds out that she is pregnant. And we think that Elizabeth was probably either Mary's aunt or, or a close cousin. They're, they are related in some way. And so Zechariah and Elizabeth, according to Luke, are very elderly, long past the time when they would be child, um, having children, and they are childless as the story here begins. And so uh, Zechariah is a priest in the temple, and part of his duties are to uh, occasionally uh, go into the Holy of Holies, that, that special sanctuary uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, and he's supposed to go there to perform some priestly rituals, um, lighting of incense, uh, and other things. Uh, one tradition says that the Holy of Holies was such a special place because the Hebrews believed that God resided there, his presence resided there, that they would tie a rope around the ankle of the priest who would go into that uh, sanctuary, that special sanctuary. In case God struck him dead, they could pull him out. I mean, after all, you don't want to catch God in a bad mood. That was Israel's uh, sort of view of what could potentially happen. And so uh, if the priest was struck dead, they could pull him out with act without actually entering the Holy of Holies. That's one of the tradition stories anyway. So Zechariah goes into this uh, special sanctuary to perform his usual business, but when he gets there, it's not business as usual. And so you take a look at Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 11, we see what happened to Zechariah. It reads, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him John. Verse 16. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents of their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So we read here about an angel who's appearing uh, for God. Uh, angel comes from the Greek word angelus, which in English is angel, it, it really means messenger. So God has sent this messenger and he is there to inform Zechariah of the good news. And we have to think that because of the age of Zechariah and Elizabeth, this idea that they're gonna have children is probably coming from, in their mind, a long forgotten prayer. They probably prayed earnestly early in their marriage and throughout their uh, 30s and 40s, uh, 50s even, uh, that they would have a child, but that time has long since passed. So that prayer has either been forgotten or uh, they've given up on that. But here they hear the good news that they're going to have a child. They're supposed to name him John, and his mission is to serve the Lord by preparing Israel for the Adventists, the arrival of uh, Christ the Lord. Now, there's a reference here in the passage to Elijah, and we have to remember Elijah is a, is a famous, uh, well-known prophet uh, within Israel's history. And Elijah called Israel back into repentance, which is going to be the same assignment that John has. And so the angel is telling this to Zechariah, and Zechariah as a priest would realize that his son is going to have a major role in the upcoming arrival of the Messiah. 
And the angel tells Zechariah that uh, John will have the same power and authority uh, to accomplish great things and move um, Israel back into repentance in a similar way that Elijah did. And so if you think about the scene for a moment, it's, it's really uh, amazing. And I, I could only equate it to imagine if you got up in the middle of the night at uh, 2 a.m. and you went down to the kitchen. And in your kitchen, leaning up against the counter, was an angel. And you could only think what your reaction might be. You'd be afraid. You'd be freaked out. Uh, the angel tells you it's okay. Don't be, don't be scared. Uh, so this is the mindset that we find uh, Zechariah in. And what if when you went down to your kitchen at 2 o'clock in the morning and you encountered an angel, an angel told you that a long-forgotten prayer that you had made has been heard and God is about to do the impossible. How would you react to that? First of all, you're startled and scared because there's an angel in your kitchen. Secondly, he's telling you that he is there representing God to tell you that the prayer that you previously made maybe years and years ago has been heard and will be answered. So how would you reply to that? Well, let's see how Zechariah did. Look at Luke 1, beginning in verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, pretty bluntly, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I haven't been, I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until this day approaches because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Whenever we read this passage, at me personally, I can't help but think, uh, feel a little sorry for Zachariah and, and think about his circumstance. His disbelief is based on the unexpected good news delivered by an angelic being. And so that's a lot to process. And sometimes when things seem uh, impossible, it's hard to fathom. I mean, after all, Zachariah just went in the temple to do his normal thing, to light some candles and and uh, maybe say a prayer for the nation of Israel while he was in the Holy of Holies. He was not prepared for what God was going to do uh, through uh, his marriage to Elizabeth. And as believers, sometimes we have to acknowledge or confess that we're not prepared for God to do the impossible in our lives. We may certainly pray about things, but sometimes we do so as a last resort. We don't do so with any confidence. And um, you know whether, whether those prayers were about our health or our family relationships or finances, whatever it might be, we don't expect God to do the impossible. And so we're not prepared when God does bring such a rescue. And so, this passage really is talking about, are we prepared in a relationship for God to do something what we deem to be impossible in our lives? Because in Christ, all things are possible. Our faith is about trusting a God who can do amazing things, who has done amazing things in our past, and can do some incredible, seemingly impossible things in our future. We have to be prepared for that reality and not just assume that our problems are too big for God to solve. Um, I don't think we are really prepared for some of the amazing things that God does for us. Sometimes we even forget the ones he's done in the past. And so Zechariah is so unprepared that we read here that he basically insults the angel for delivering the good news. I mean, he says, how can I know for sure? that this is true. Translation, dude, I hear what you're saying. It seems highly unlikely. I'd like some proof. That's how Zechariah responds to the angel. By the way, if you meet an angel at 2 a.m. in your kitchen and he tells you something God is going to do that seems impossible, don't insult him. 
That's tip number one we learn from this passage. So in this case, the angel responds to Zechariah's question, asking for proof, or if you want to just interpret it as di disbelief, he responds in a pretty harsh way. And this is my interpretation of what the angel is saying. He's telling Zechariah, yeah, I got proof. I'm Gabriel. I stand before God, and you will shut your trap until God does what he's going to do at the appointed time. So no more commentary from you, Zechariah, because you did not believe. This is how the angel responds to the disbelief of Zechariah. But I, I think it really goes back to the fact that Zechariah was never prepared for God to do something that seemed impossible in his life. And we shouldn't fall into that trap. We should always be open to the idea that no matter how big our prayers may be, that God will actually answer them. We should be prepared for the fact that when we pray, even in our moments when we have negativity and, and no hope, when we present it to God, we need to present it to him confident that he can resolve the issue for us. We need to prepare for that. Um, because we know that if we don't do that, then sometimes God doesn't respond to the way that we are calling for because we're not prepared to handle the good news that may be coming. And so really Advent is, is all about the traditions of the church, but if we really look back to when Advent first started in the sixth century, it's about preparation for us for the upcoming celebration of the original arrival of Jesus Christ, the initial advent. We're supposed to be preparing ourselves, uh, prayer, fasting, and certainly recommitting uh, in our relationship to God because God does amazing things. Part of our whole Count Your Blessings sermon series that we did before Thanksgiving. God does amazing things, and we need to be prepared for him to do something amazing for us now or in the future. And so when we pray, we need to have that anticipation and not be caught off guard like Zechariah was. God may, for example, show us mercy and grace when what we really deserve is punishment or discipline. God does the impossible far more often than we realize. And it's our lack of preparation sometimes that prevents us from either seeing it or being ready to experience it, ready to praise him for the appointed time when God answers our prayer, the appointed time being a reference to what the angel told Zechariah. So right now, maybe you've got some prayers on the burner, things that are in your life that are really um, something that's at the front of your mind. It could be anything. It could be about your situation or somebody else's situation uh, that you care about. The divine appointed time has not arrived yet. And while you wait, you prepare yourself for God to respond to whatever those situations are, whatever those prayers are, and be ready for him to do the impossible. So how do we prepare? Well, we got to spend more time in prayer and less time in doubt or disbelief that God could actually resolve the situation we're in. Because sometimes we don't see the resolution happening around us, so we begin to lose confidence that could possibly be resolved in a way that was favorable. So we need to spend more time in prayer. We need to spend more time in Scripture. Why? So we can read about folks like Zachariah and Elizabeth and how they were unprepared as a lesson for us to be more ready for God to do something amazing, learning the importance of preparing our hearts for what God may do, getting ready, so to speak, for God to do the impossible. Christmas time, the time of the Advent, is preparing us to improve our relationship with God so we are more ready when he does some amazing things. It was the same for Israel that first Christmas, and it's the same for us now. Always be prepared is not just a motto used by the scouts. It's how we are supposed to act as Christians, always being prepared and ready for God to do something spectacular. 
And it's my belief the more prepared we are through reading scripture, um, spending time with other Christians in church, and certainly in prayer, the more likely we are to see some of these amazing things happen uh, around us. We won't be so distracted by the world. So we need to get ready, uh, leaving our prayers in God's hands and not taking them into our own hands, trying to do it on our own without God's wisdom or intervention. Let's not insult an angel. Let's prepare ourselves during this Advent season for God to do the impossible. Amen? There'll be a video attached to this sermon right down there. I hope you enjoy it. Until the next time we gather, be blessed.